as we gather, there are people by the thousands running around the streets of Little Rock in the Little Rock Marathon. Be mindful of them. Be prayerful for them. And on your way home, do not run over them. That is their prayer. That you will have enough love of God in you to stay on your side of the highway and let them run in peace uh, so that they can feel better. Amen. Amen. Uh, please be prayerful for Sister Frey as she runs. Uh, Brother Elliot is playing, his band is playing to entertain the runners, so be proud for the, for the runners and those who are giving water to the runners and the police officers who are trying to keep the folks from running over the runners and the paramedics who are standing by to give aid to the runners who are in distress as well as all others who are there. Your pastor had at one time the thought of running but I overcame it. <laughs> after you tried two blocks, you quit. Right. Well, something about after that 13th mile. <laughs> uh, but that is another story, if not another sermon. I want to talk today about encountering the God who transforms us encountering the God who transforms us. And as we do so, I want to thank uh, Deb Givens for, the, uh, for printing the, the bulletin art. Uh, the cover on your bulletin is, as you see from the back, uh, a rendition of uh, a Byzantine artwork that's dated to about the 12th century uh, uh, in this era of the Transfiguration that features that depicts Jesus, uh, as well as Moses, Elijah, and the three apostles. Uh, thanks to the internet, we can find that and share that. The transfiguration of Jesus is reported by the Gospels of Matthew, as we've read, Mark, and Mark, ninth chapter, verses 2 through 8, and Luke the ninth chapter of Luke, verses 28 through 36, as a decisive turning point in the life and ministry of Jesus. Each account reports that Jesus ascended a mountain with Peter, James, and John, his closest followers, his inner circle, his closest companions in ministry. Each account reports that Jesus was transfigured, was visibly changed before their astonished eyes. His face was shining, as we read in the text, like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Each account reports that Jesus was joined by Moses, the liberator and lawgiver, and Elijah, the greatest prophet of the Hebrew people. And in each account, Peter, James, and John heard a voice affirm Jesus as the beloved, with whom the heavenly speaker was well pleased. And in each account, Peter suggested to Jesus that structures be created, erected. Perhaps Peter thought it was a good idea to turn the transfiguration site that is traditionally believed to be Mount Tabor near Nazareth, but may have been Mount Hermon, into a retreat center where Jesus could be comfortable and be visited by faithful souls who desired to commune with Jesus and Moses and Elijah. Something remarkable, something unforgettable, something inspiring happened to Jesus on that mountain. Whatever happened not only transfigured Jesus, it transformed Jesus. And that transfiguring and transforming experience on the mountain 
help prepare Jesus to transcend everything people had expected concerning his life, his ministry, and his purpose. Jesus didn't go to the mountain to begin his relationship with God. His relationship with God led him there. He had already been in fellowship with God for a while. He had already been doing and living out God's purpose in his life. His sense of being on a mission from God led him to get away from the routine and the usual sights and sounds of his ministry and spend some dedicated time in prayer on the mountain. Away from the routine and usual sights and sounds of ministry, Jesus was transfigured. Away from the routine and usual sights and sounds of ministry, Jesus received prophetic comfort from and visitation with Moses and Elijah. And away from the routine and usual sights and sounds of ministry, Jesus was reaffirmed, re-inspired, renewed, and recharged. We get a better sense for why Jesus broke away and underwent that transfiguring and transforming trip to the mountain from Luke's version of the transfiguration account. Although the accounts from Matthew, Mark, and Luke all report that Peter, James, and John heard and saw Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus, only Luke's account tells us what Moses and Elijah were talking about. At Luke's account, at verses, nine, at verses 30 and 31 of the ninth chapter of Luke, Luke tells us that Moses and Elijah were speaking of his departure, which Jesus was to accomplish at Jerusalem. Moses and Elijah, you see, were helping Jesus prepare for the ordeal of arrest, trial, abuse, crucifixion, and death that lay before him. God summoned Jesus to a place of transfiguration and transformation just as God trans summoned Moses. You recall God summoned Moses to a place of transfiguration and transformation as we read in the passage that Joyce Williams led us in. After Moses led the Hebrew slaves from Egyptian oppression, God summoned Elijah to a place of transformation. After Elijah confronted the idolatrous practices and priests of religious materialism and hedonism who served the cruel and oppressive rulers King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, now God summons Jesus to be re-inspired and reassured by the company of Moses and Elijah. In the same way that God summoned Jesus away from his usual and ordinary routine to give Jesus a renewed sense of God's glory and new insight and strength to fulfill God's purposes for his life, we too are called away from our usual and customary efforts to encounter God anew and afresh. This is what God calls us to experience in worship. This is the idea behind the Sabbath. The whole idea behind the Sabbath is for God to get us away from the usual and customary routine, sights and sounds, hustle and bustle of living, so that God can, in a sense, transfigure and transform us, and inform us, and reassure us. Because God has prophetic messages and messengers for us to encounter, away from the usual hustle and bustle of our living. God has new insights to reveal to us about who we are in God's purpose, away from the usual sights and sounds, hustle and bustle living. God has new strength to impart to us so we can face our purpose in living with a determined and refreshed outlook. God has a place of transfiguration and transformation of us for us just as God had for Jesus. That is because we too need renewal. We too need reinvigoration. We, too, need re-inspiration. 
we too need to be re-encouraged and reaffirmed and reminded that God has called us to be prophetic forces in the world. We, like Jesus, need to hear God anew and be reassured that we are God's beloved children of hope and truth and grace and strength and victory in the face of despair and lies and guilt and weakness and defeat. So God calls us in worship and in every other worshipful experience to transfiguring places and situations in order that we might be transformed so we can serve God with more strength and more confidence and more determination. And when God calls us, God will impart messengers that will bolster our strength, reinforce our confidence, and recharge our determination. Jesus was summoned to the place of transfiguration so he could be prepared to continue ministry in the face of a coming crisis. However, Peter had other ideas. Peter had plans after he witnessed the powerful presence of Elijah and Moses to build a retreat center. Now, Peter was going to build a religious place. He wasn't going to build a honky-tonk. He was planning to build a holy place. Peter was close to Jesus. But notice that Peter's announcement of his plans and his suggestion to Jesus. Ask Jesus for permission. Lord, if you want us to, I'll build it now. I'm ready. His suggestion to Jesus comes after Peter sees Moses and Elijah who are there to talk with Jesus about going to Calvary. Jesus hears prophetic vo prophetic voices from Moses and Elijah preparing him for Calvary and at his side he hears Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to build you a retreat center. Let's stay up here a while. Now, Jesus had already told Peter that he was going to go to Jerusalem. Jesus had already told Peter in the chapter ahead of this, in this chapter we read about the need to go to Jerusalem and face persecution and be arrested and be put to death. You recall this is after Peter had said, you are the beloved son, the Christ, the Messiah, the promised Messiah. And Jesus said, you, you are Peter, the rock, and upon this rock I'll build my church. And immediately after that, Jesus said, i got to go to Jerusalem. And as soon as Peter heard that, Peter pitched, uh, as, as Peter heard that, Peter got the blues. Because that was not part of his plan for Jesus. So it is not unfair, perhaps, to suggest that it is not by accident that Peter came up with the idea to build a retreat center after he heard Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus about getting ready to go to Calvary. You understand, Peter wasn't having in that Calvary business. He was real holy about the retreat center. He was not down with Calvary. And in the same way, in the same way, we need to recognize that God was preparing Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration for crucifixion on another hill that wouldn't be a retreat center, but it would be a redemption center called Calvary. Peter wanted to turn Jesus into a religious recluse. God was preparing Jesus to become the symbol of redemptive grace. Peter wanted Jesus to have a comfortable and, and be a popular figure. God was preparing Jesus for a future that was anything but comfortable, but was increasingly confrontational, growing in unpopularity, and would end in the cruel discomfort and ignominy of death by crucifixion. And so it can be with us as it was with Peter. We may find ourselves planning and building projects in God's name that are aimed not at fulfilling God's highest and best purposes, but at avoiding them. 
we may actually ask God, like Peter, to bless our plan. Read what Peter says, Lord, if it's your will, I'll build it. Commission me, Lord, building superintendent of the retreat center. I'm ready. We don't have any record that Peter brought hammer or nails with him, but Peter was ready. We have no record that Jesus suggested there was a need for a retreat center, but Peter was ready. We may find ourselves like Peter, planning and building projects aimed at avoiding the necessary risk and burdens of prophetic living. We may find ourselves all too willing to engage in religious busy work, in comparative comfort and security, rather than face the subversive and painful prophetic confrontations that are always part of overcoming oppression and wickedness and injustice. Peter reminds us that even when we are close to God and have been living with God for a while, we are prone to substitute our more comfortable notions of what living for God means for the radical and risky call of God's prophetic will in our lives. Peter's example should cause each of us to ask of ourselves, am I trying to figure out some safe and comfortable way to live for God that doesn't involve prophetic confrontation and risk? Do I think that being saved entitles me to be safe? Am I like Peter? Well, God always has a message that will set us right. Through the mist, through the mist of a cloud, Peter heard the voice saying, This is my beloved in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. In other words, Peter, shut up. That's the Griffin's paraphrase. Hush, Peter. You're talking out of turn. You don't need to be talking. You need to be listening. God's voice can break through the mist of our misunderstanding about what living for God involves. God can send prophetic messengers to encourage and remind us that we have been summoned to be holy risk takers and difference makers in a world that needs risk takers and difference making. God can and will confront and correct us when we, like Peter, want to turn God's call to prophetic living into something a whole lot less dangerous, a whole lot less uncomfortable, a whole lot more convenient. Like Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, we are called from the ordinary routine sights and sounds of living and ministry into this special place of holy reflection each week. Like Jesus, we are visited through scripture by prophetic heroes and heroines across the ages. Like Peter was tempted when he was with Jesus, we also are tempted to embrace a view of living that is more comfortable than prophetic, more socially and politically safe than risky, and more popular than unpopular. God has called us, just as God summoned Jesus, to this place of reflection and re-inspiration to prepare us to re-enter the moral and social fray of living with new prophetic confidence and determination and strength. God calls us to follow other prophetic people who have laid their lives and futures on the line for truth and love and justice and grace and peace and hope. God does not call us to turn this place into a retreat center. No. God does not call us to call, turn this place into a country club. God does not call us to turn this place into a park. No. The time we spend here is to be used to repair and to refit and recommission us for prophetic service in the Star Wars saga that we know as life where evil forces 
and systems work oppressive results and harms on people and the creation. God calls us as God called Jesus to be transfigured and transformed here. And God ultimately calls us here to send us from here to live transformed lives that transcend notions of comfort and privilege and convenience and popularity. God calls us to take on the risk of becoming God's social outcasts and even outlaws in the name of righteousness and truth and justice. God doesn't call us to take on the comfortable conditions and soft robes of priests, but to take on the rough life and the coarse garments of prophets. And because it is who God calls us, and God's voice ascends us into the rough and deadly world of our usual sights and sounds, we draw strength because we know it is God's voice. It is the voice that said, let there be at the beginning of the Bible. You recall, it was the voice that called, as Gardner Taylor loves to say it, everything that was not and everything that was not began to stand rank on rank, getting ready to become what it never had been. God calls us to be what nobody else thinks we can be. Not because there is a majority that says we can, but because the authority of God commands that we must be this. And because it is who God is that calls us. Because it is God's voice that calls us. Let us draw strength from these precious moments that we encounter God in transforming and tra transfiguring experiences in worship. Let us leave this place in strength. Let us not park here. Let us process from here. And leave this place in strength, determined like Jesus left the Mount of Transfiguration, full of a fresh sense and abiding confirmation that we are, to use the words of my favorite Blues Brothers line, on a mission from God. Because that's what we are in the world. And that's why God calls us to this Mount of Transfiguration called worship. Amen. Amen.